The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. If somebody were to say, Mike, you're wrong, why would I ever get upset? There's nothing in me that would get upset. Do you know why? Because that word is the word of God. And it's up to each individual to choose. God does nothing by force. Everything is by freedom. And if they choose when their sight is restored, great. If they don't, that's a sad day. There's no vindication in the loss of a soul. None. My sincere hope is that many, many, many make it. I am by no means a condemner because I know that without the anointing, I would never be kept. Without the anointing, I would not even keep my own faith that I have in Christ. None of us can ever brag and say by our own merit, we have kept our faith. No, we have been kept by the Most High through Christ. You just read that. And it's that same power that will be our deliverance through Christ. So when you hear in Revelation, the condemnation reserved for those for a specific time, don't be afraid. Learn to hear in the context of the word. In other words, you cannot open a book, read one sentence of that book, and expect to know what the entire book was about. You can't do that. Chapter by chapter, you have to build, you have to learn, you have to see the context. By the end of the book, you have a complete context, not incomplete. And that takes a lot of study. So that's where we are. Somebody says, will all Israel truly be saved? All those appointed to the living God will never be lost. Now here's the deal though. Only God knows who belongs to him and who does not. That's why I don't concern myself with that. I don't. Not even of you guys. I have a hope that everybody makes it. And because God did not label us wheat or tear, he did not. And I'm glad he did not because if he did, we could not love our enemy. We couldn't do it. We would condemn our enemy. Right? I have a hope for all. Just as God has a hope for all. Did you know your Father in Heaven has a hope that everybody makes? And who am I to stand against what He loves the most? Somebody said, I feel like we're going through the uh, times of the seven churches. I believe this. I believe that in each church. It's just like a family tree. You have one person born who has many children. Now, all those children have different traits that come from that mean source. Then they have children. And those children have many traits of many different sources. I believe we are the same way. But because there are seven churches, because there are seven angels, because there are seven spirits of God, I do believe that we deal with the same thing over and over and over again. Which means we deal with one of those seven things or, or many of those seven things, but they're always going to be in the context of the seven. I think the Lord just gave us what we must overcome when we deal in the body of Christ, as we grow in the body of Christ, I think it just told us what to overcome. Because every time I read about the seven churches, I notice traits of everybody in every, this is since, uh, you know, whether it be 50 years ago or right now, everybody has always dealt with, uh, with some of those obstacles, those uh, issues that are in the seven churches. Not one person is free from that. Somebody's going through that. So I believe that it, it that involves the seven, seven spirits of the living God that we are anointed with, right? That's why you have, uh, there are certain people who are good at certain things. There are other people who love specific things and are good at certain things, right? So on and so forth. And so the Lord said that we're a, a body made up of many different members. Well, how do we become many different members? Because we are of the spirit of the living God. And if we are, then everything is consistent with who he is. And since that is the case, then all of our problems, all of the issues that we face, we face because we're dealing in a specific way with the world that we see, which is right there in the seven churches. Remember, the letter goes to the seven angels of the seven churches. So those will be the message bearers, the ones who carry the message. Oh, there you go. Somebody said thoughts on a serpent seed is very easy. Satan sowed seeds in the earth alongside human beings. And what was that? Cain is the first example of that. The first example of that manifest serpent's seed. Cain is. 
Cain murdered his brother to seek or to gain position. Right. He did. He was a murderer. That's why Jesus and the apostles, right? And in, you know, he referred to him as what? The wicked one. The same word used for Judas, the same word used for the Antichrist, is the same word used for kings of the same spirit. So when Jesus talked about the field, which is full of tares, and that the wicked one came and sowed seeds, among those tares, and, and the angel said, well, should we go and remove, you know, the, the, uh, the tares from the wheat? And, and what did the Lord say? The Lord said, no, lest you do what? Damage the wheat. How can the wheat be damaged if evil is taken from it prematurely? Anybody? Anybody have an answer? How could you be damaged if all evil was removed from you right now? How? If God were to come and take evil out of the earth, and everywhere it was, he come and took it, he came and took it out of the earth, why would that damage you? Anybody? Why would that damage you? Here's why. You ready? I'm going to share with you guys why. Something obvious. Something you already know. I'm just going to bring it out. The Lord said, first of all, the Lord said, don't let them grow together. And then when they're full grown, when they bear fruit, harvest them. That's what he said, harvest them. When, when they're full grown, then harvest them. Was that for identification? So the angels could see who was who? No, they already know who's who. God empowers them as he assigns them. So God knows who is who. The angels proposed, let's go get up these, let's get these tares now before anything grows. And God said, no, no, let them grow together. Lest you damage the wheat. Here's how you could be damaged. Right now, you're in a vulnerable state, but that's dying, but you're still in a vulnerable state. You may say, how so? Well, I'll tell you how. You guys, I'm going to use politics as an example. And the only reason I'm doing that is so it sticks, so it irritates your flesh a little bit. But most people, they look at political figures and they deify their favorite figure. They do. Just go ahead and face when to deify a figure is simply to fight your fellow man over what you like of some other person. Man, that's deification. That's when you turn something into an idol or demigod. Anyway, people do this. Why? And they will sit there and call their favorite candidate great God-fearing. I've heard it. I've heard it from every president we ever had, right? But that, that I was born in that time. But people said, oh, no, they love the Lord. Each one that they liked, they said that. Why would a person say that? Can all of them be right? That means every single president loved the Lord. Here's the deal. If a person truly believes that, but that's not the way the person is. And if God were to remove evil from the earth and you would see the penalty, you would be confused as to who God is. That's what would, you would say, well, why did God remove such a good person? Why did God allow such a good person to, you know, this or that? And you would be damaged. Why? Because you would not know the true nature of the individual. Thus, you would think it was an unfair issue or unfair consequence or something. So what God does is this. He lets everything grow. And he also sustains life of both. And when people feel the sting of certain types of evil, right? They begin to identify that same evil everywhere. By the time the angels harvest, you're going to know who is who. A lot of people right now, they're saying, well, evil's rising all over the earth. No, it isn't. Evil has always been evil. Here's the issue. We have not always been able to discern what evil is. We thought evil was harmless. We thought television was harmless. People thought, you know, disco music was harmless. People thought that pill was harmless. They thought a couple of drinks was, it was harmless. People think, you know, those things are harmless until time allows for the resolving of what something is. And when you suffer under the hand or under the influence of whatever it is, then you find out that's not good for you. Then as time continues, you say, Lord, please remove it. Remove it from everything because you begin to see it. It takes us growing with evil to see evil, to understand it. Because evil does not look evil in the beginning. Evil looks like your brother. Evil looks like your sister. Evil looks like a promise, doesn't it? Iniquity. It looks like it can fulfill you, just like Eve. Eve. Eve said what about the fruit of the tree of life, of which God said, do not touch it nor eat of it. What did Eve say? Oh, it's good for food. It's good to make one wise. All these different, she found all the good in it. And God said, don't touch it, didn't he? So it, we have to grow with the tears, or we would be the first ones confused as to why a good person would have to perish, or a good person would have to be judged, or a good person 
right? Would have to go through so much and then ultimately be removed. We would be hurt. Well, why did God do that? That was a good, nice person. The biggest part of the harvest is the uncovering. The uncovering is when a seed grows into a big stalk or plant that it begins to bear its seed. A lot of people go through the wilderness and they'll say, ah, oh, that looks like an apple tree. But in truth, it's not an apple tree. Then when it bears this fruit, you can tell exactly what it is. Before the fruit comes out, you don't know what it is. You can make a mistake. When the fruit comes out, there's no making a mistake. You won't make a mistake then. And so God is doing that. Now do you see? Because we think we're right when we like something. We think we're right. And the Lord's going to show us what is true. He's not going to support what we think. He's going to show us the truth. And sometimes you're going to find you yourself as being right about something. Sometimes you're going to find yourself as being wrong about something. Either way, he's going to show us the truth. And when we can see the truth, then when he gathers up all the tares together in bundles and throws them in the fire, we're not going to be hurt by that. But if he did that right now in this very moment, many of us would be hurt. Because we still can't get over the fact that no one dies prematurely. We still can't get over the fact that no one's going to have an accident. Just not a circumstance. We still can't get over the fact that our lives are highly managed. Some of you guys have gone through some pretty bad things. And many can't get over the fact that God permitted that for your well-being, not for your destruction. So there's, there's some things we still have yet to learn. The harvest, it is coming. Because the night, it is coming. The night is coming where no man can work. That night will be full of filthiness. But it will be gathered. And the Lord's hand is upon you. So you're good to go. Do you all see that now? That's why. There we are. Understand that as we read. Because what we're about to read can often cause anger to come up. The only way a person would ever get angry at the truth is if they're blind. That's what your father says. He said, if you're blind, put eyes have on your eyes. But only Christ can do that for you. But one thing we don't have to do, we never have to make up a theory. We never have to guess something because God is, you're going to find that the Lord told us everything within Revelation. It, just like the uh, the beast. A lot of people say, well, you know, you've got to go in a dictionary to find the beast. Not really. God gave us an interpretation of exactly what it was talking about. What we should have done was read the whole book of Revelation, not just a piece. Because you'll find that he explained what the elements were that sound so strange. In that case, he wasn't referring to what most people thought he was referring to. All they had to do was continue to read and they would have seen for themselves. So he gives the interpretation in the same book in which he gave the object of Revelation. Something in it. God gave us what we needed. But let's go ahead and face it, guys. Let's go ahead and face it. We're human beings, and we like, you know, we can't watch the, the same thing over and over again. We have to add something to it to make it more exciting, so we think. That's the mindset that's failing in the world right now. Somebody says, what can we do to protect ourselves against that dust that is coming? You can't do anything. Therefore, that's why you shouldn't worry about it. You know what the Lord said? Listen, how many of you belong to Christ? Or, let, let me change that. How many of you, honestly believe in Christ. You, you really do believe in Christ. <clears throat> you know he's the Messiah and you accept him. You accept that sacrifice upon the cross because this is why we're reading the letters of John because we have got to get past the point of uh, there's a part of us that will acknowledge who Jesus is but there's still parts of us who have not received him. See there are things that we are capable of doing and there's a way that we still have to ourselves we should not have at all. Like a person whose deeds match up with, a, with what a Christian expects. Is that person going to the everlasting kingdom? If their deeds line up with the word of God perfectly, are they going into the kingdom of God? Will they step foot in the kingdom of God? If they talk about Christ and their deeds are perfect, right? And they seem like they love the Lord, but every so often... They express a hatred towards someone. Are they going to step foot into the kingdom of God? The answer is no. That's what the answer is. See, because a lot of people are being fooled and tricked. They're trying to conform to what the Lord wants by way of their deeds, by doing the right thing. Too bad, because that's all fine and dandy. But in your heart is who you are. And when you go to the eternal realm, your deeds are only going to represent those things that you did on the earth. 
But if your heart is all twisted and your motive was all messed up, that means you never recognized or knew your father. That's why it's impossible for anybody who hates their brother to know who God is. They don't know who God is. They have never known who God was. It's impossible to hate someone when you know who God is. That's impossible. It's just like Christ. If he died on the cross for you, how in the, and you receive it and you know you sin, how can you turn around and hate anybody for their sin? That's impossible. That means you're going through motions, but you have not embraced what he did. Because it's impossible to hate him. And you know what? That's written in the Bible too many times. So many times people skip over it. They will not turn to it. It's kind of like some of these people who like to blame other folks. They do not read about forgiveness. Right? They don't mention that word forgiveness. Fault finders. They do not mention the word forgiveness. They will not forgive. All they do is find fault. And in their hearts is a murderous spirit. Did you know that? And God sees the truth of them. It's like a person who continues to sin in this world. Right? If a person die in their sin, how can they do that if they believe in the living God in Christ? Who among you has a desire to sin? I don't. It doesn't mean that I, I'm always successful. But I'm overcoming those elements of flesh. It's not some hard thing either. It's as simple as this. The Lord went through pain and agony so my sins could be wiped away. I have no desire to sin because I have a desire to conform to the Lord's ways. It's in my heart. Even when your life deeds fall short of what's in your heart, whatever's in your heart is going to manifest because you'll never stop attempting to do it. Those people who give up, how can they fully embrace Christ? You can't give up if you embrace Christ. You can't. Because instantly in your mind, you'll say, He never gave up on me. He never gave up on anybody. What do I do? You'll have no desire. There'll be zero desire in you to dishonor what Jesus did. And you will walk by appreciation, love, and a full embrace of what he did at the cross. And you cannot help but to love your father for sending the son. And that's something. But the key is, if it's in your heart, it's going to manifest. If you're going through motions and your whole life line up to it, but your heart has not, you will not step foot in the kingdom of God. You will have kept yourself for nothing. For the slaughter, actually. I'm telling you this now because in the word, you're going to find those words quite heavy, direct, right between the eyes. And they really do convey an obvious truth to all of us. Now, can, does a person have time to turn all that around? You better believe it. Which is why they should begin today. You know what's so funny? Nobody, nobody knows their true state of being. Only God knows. God knows what your true state of being is. God knows exactly who you are. And because you have life in this day, you've been given an opportunity to change it because he does not want to lose you. If a person is ever condemned in the earth, they will not have life in the earth. No condemned person in the word of God lived. Do you know that? So that means every person you see, whether you believe they're corrupt or not, God has given them the opportunity. Do you know? And if he gave them an opportunity, we have a work to do. Something funny. God never said in Revelation, it was too late for the people of earth until a very specific time. And we are not there yet. To love the Lord is to love his word, is to agree with him. You cannot disagree with Christ like the Pharisees did and expect to be a son of God. That won't work. People do that now. And that's not going to work. So our father's going to break all that. That's what we're reading about. He's going to break us out of our stupor. Then we're going to see. Then plenty will come back. Then it will all be done. Right? But look what he has cultivated within your hearts. Look how much. You call upon him. Look at the relationship you have with Christ. Even if you think you're, you don't have a real good one, you still have a relationship. Look at how your relationship has grown. Look at how you speak to him internally in your heart. Look at how bad you feel when you do something wrong. That's beautiful. When you go out there and sin, you say, oh, I let the Lord down again. That is beautiful. Because you'd have to have a heart of stone and coal not to feel that way. All of you out there that say, well, I don't want to disappoint the Lord again. Of course, you can't disappoint him. And it's beautiful that you feel that way because that is sincerity. That's what that is. But now it's time to act, not to publish what you did, but to act on the truth of you. You don't have to deny anymore that you're a person 
right? Who has fallen short of the glory of God. But you have a great desire to be a pleasing child. You don't have to act like you want to be a pleasing child to the living God. You don't have to act that way anymore. You can become that person. You can be that person. And you can strive. The process the Lord gave us, beautiful process. All right, guys, here we go. We're going to start reading. So we're going into the book of Revelation. Now, last time we stopped, we were in Revelation chapter 3. We were reading, about to read, about Sardis and Philadelphia. Let's go ahead and read this, shall we? Revelation chapter 3. And unto the angel of Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God. Thank you, Lord. And the seven stars. You hear that? Listen. Seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So the seven spirits of God are different than the seven stars. But why am I so excited that that is mentioned? Because the seven spirits of God and the seven stars and the seven golden candlesticks. Not because we're all seven. But because for every spirit of God, there is a messenger. And for every messenger, there's a place of occupation. Each spirit lining up with one of the seven, doesn't matter which. It means that God does everything in such completeness, but he never leaves us lacking. That's why I get excited. It's a deeper principle. God never sends us lacking in anything. For the belief that you have, that's just like us here at COT, love us first. With me, so for the majority of you, love is first. You have seen the hypocrisy of those who have fake love, and you don't like it. You have seen it. You know why? Because that's within me. I have seen the hypocrisy of fake love. You guys have had enough of it, or else you wouldn't tolerate listening to me. There'd be no way in the world you'd tolerate listening to me. You guys like the sincere walk in love, right? You're not, you're not extremely abrasive. You're not. But you've most certainly had a challenge dealing with that word love. Many of you in your youth, love betrayed you, you thought. You couldn't trust it for a long time. And in the voice of anybody who speaks, you can discern who's speaking with love and who is not. That's what you're discerning. So, God made sure nobody would be without armament, guidance, protection. He made sure everybody would be covered. He made sure of that. These things, saith he, that hath the seven spirits of God, the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful, strengthen the things which remain and are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how that thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, we went over all this, I will come to thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled the garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name of the book of life, but will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And, the, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true. He that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shunneth, and he that shunneth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. Let me pause. He set before you an open door, and no man can shut that door. That is so beautiful, because some of you actually believed that somebody could dupe you into being condemned. No, they cannot. That's impossible. Some of you had a thought in your mind. Well, I wonder if, if somebody's deceiving me and I believe the wrong thing. I end up being condemned because I'm believing in something that was, you know, based in error. That's why you have the spirit that supersedes all grammatical errors of humanity. All the sneaky things they could have ever performed. The source of truth is your filter. And he did not leave your salvation up to any person crooked or righteous in the earth but your salvation is solely in the hands of you and jesus christ how about that nobody else can interfere with that if you say yes to jesus and picked up a book and it had hogwash in there your lord can make that book resonate with you in your spirit but you will only extract the truth and how many of you have read scriptures in the bible and you said, there it is. And you read it again. And you said, there it is. So you went to go take a break, meditating on it. You said, let me go find that again so I can jot that down. 
and you can never ever find it in your Bible again. How many have done that before? You found it. You saw it more than once right in that session. But when you got up, went away and came back, it was not there. How many have done that? And to this day, you can't find it. Let me tell you what your father does. If you read something in the Bible and you're just academic and you're, you're devoid of the spirit, you're going to be left with the words. When you belong to Christ and you read something and God wants you to have the truth, you will see that truth and receive it. He'll always supersede your tangible world. He'll change whatever he has to change so that you have the truth. He's doing that for you. You couldn't go back and find it because what you received was somewhat supernatural. That's why. But it was the truth because you've heard it again and again. And then it pops up in other people's sermons when they reference other books that you never read before because it was supernatural, which means it was not an error. It was given to you supernaturally. You wanted to go back and document it because you wanted to get that clear in your nose before you told somebody else. And the Lord said, no, you're not. No, this is your truth. You're going to keep this. But you will not reference this one. And you knew it was correct. But did you also notice in that moment that, that the atmosphere around you was a bit different? It's almost like something greater opened up to you in that moment. And you really didn't capture it till later on, maybe. It was a different moment that happens from time to time. Your Father in Heaven will always make sure that you have the truth. When you're stuck to academics, devoid of the Spirit, you cannot have the truth. You really can't. That's why those who read the Bible who are scholars to say but, but devoid of the Spirit cannot comprehend it. They still don't have the Word. They have broken the Bible down with, with well, let's just say quantum computers. Suppose they took CERN. And in CERN, they had some sort of procedure where they could just, you know, quadruple the capacity of the fastest computer out there. Even they wouldn't have the truth. They would not have the truth because the truth must be obtained spiritually. In your case, it has to be confirmed that way because you have the truth in you. It's impossible that you do not have the truth in you. See, there are scriptures you're going to get excited as we make reference because some of you have probably never read some of these scriptures before. And the Lord tells you very directly exactly what you are and exactly what he's doing and exactly what can never be lost and exactly what's being kept. The Lord says, He has opened a door that no man can shut, for thou hast a little strength. Haven't we heard that before? And he says, And has kept my word and has not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. This is so beautiful. Now, what does it say about these people? Listen to what he says. He says, you have little strength. You're worn out. Now, before you think he's talking about you, let's continue to read. And he says, you have little strength. You've kept my word. You have not denied my name. That means you kept his ways too, right? He says, behold, I'm going to make those of the synagogue of Satan that are vessels of Satan. That's what a synagogue is, is a vessel, a big vessel, a synagogue of Satan. It's a vessel. I'm going to make those who are vessels of Satan, which say they are Jews, but are not, and they do lie. Now, to say that you're a Jew, this word Jew in this context was used in a very strange way. Because to say that you're a Jew and that's your actual, you know, that's what you actually are, genetically is one thing. But it did not refer to a Jew in this context genetically. It's almost like he was saying, right? Because you know, in the New Testament, when he said a Jew is a Jew, a Jew is not a Jew outwardly, but inwardly. In other words, in the New Testament, because the standard came alive, God was telling us through Christ that a Jew, his chosen, anointed, set-apart people, are not his anointed, chosen, set-apart people because of their DNA anymore. No. Now it's because of their spirit. Remember the born-again spirit? Those are God's children now. Those are God's children. That's why I said a Jew is not a Jew outwardly, but inwardly. In other words, your DNA is not going to define who you are anymore. Even Jesus, Jesus was telling us all this. In this context, is using it that way. And in the first, first time I ever read this, you're kind of not sure if he's talking about, you know, genetic Jews or being a Jew by your acceptance of Christ. 
In this case, he's talking about the acceptance of Christ. Those of you who accept Christ, not so much, you know, those who are Jews genetically. Now, who are the synagogue of Satan? Just as he told those Pharisees, you're a brood of vipers. You're the synagogue of Satan. He told them that. Why? Because they were trying to kill him. And he said, your father is the devil because he was a murderer from the beginning. You're trying to kill me. He was revealing to them that the spirit of the serpent seeks to murder, to crucify. That's what it does. It wants to teach people how. And it does talk to people to tell them, you have to get revenge or you have to get justice. Oops. Did I say that? Because in today's world, justice means when a person says, I want justice, what they're really saying is, crucify him. That's what they're saying in this day and age. Why do I say that? Because when they do prosecute somebody who actually perpetrated a crime or something like that, right? The, the, whoever the family is, they're still not satisfied. They want more people to suffer, and it never ends. And this is on all sides. I'm sorry. Locking up a murder of your family member is not going to bring you love back from that family member. To understand that whole situation, well, that's how you do it. But you have indecent, antichrist type spirits out there teaching people to sue everybody they can. When Jesus clearly told us, don't ever sue anybody. Did he not? Anyway, let me not get off track. Let me go back here. He says, I'm going to make those of the synagogue of Satan which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I'm going to make them come and worship before your feet. Now, who are those people? You ever met a Christian who says they're a Christian, and then you start talking to them, and all they do is try to turn you against a target? A person who comes to you nice, and you think they're nice and everything else, and first you're talking to them, and they may curse every 38 words. Then they start using other things. They try to make you do things you wouldn't ordinarily do so that you can be just as guilty as they are. But they came to you in the body of Christ, attempting to get you to lower your holy, your spiritual standard to make you just as guilty as they are. And then they end up causing you to point at someone because their, their ultimate goal is to make you have a target. That's what Satan does these days. He wants you to have a target. And why is that important? Because if you have a target, you can express your hatred on that target. You can cast accusation upon that target. Do everything against that target. Because when you do that, you're slandering the living God. That's what you're doing. You're doing exactly what Jesus said don't do. You're taking it upon yourself to cancel the cross of Christ in that person's life. Because if you say that a person is not worth life, you just deny Jesus Christ. If you say a person should suffer for what they did, you just deny the cross for that person in view of all men. That's why you did. See, when you're outspoken and you start doing things freely in this world, this world and the kingdoms of this world are designed against the principles of Christ. Haven't you noticed that Satan utilizes scriptures? He used scriptures when he tempted Christ. He tried to get Jesus Christ to do what? To tempt the Lord our God. Jesus would not do it. He tries to get people to do the same thing. He, he will turn you into a murderer. I stumbled. I stumbled into a chat room one time. This is a long time ago. And these people were talking negatively about everybody. And they were cursing and laughing. And then they would go back to scripture and just break out these fits and all sorts of things. And then they prayed at the end. It was the weirdest thing you'd ever seen. But they were the product of a serpent recruiting as many as they could. Now, you do know the closer we get to the harvesting, the more Satan's going to double his efforts. And what do you see in the world? It's almost like Satan is what? Doubling his efforts. That's why I told you guys at COT in 2012 and 13, for the third or fourth time I told these people selected to be presidents are stumbling blocks, and they will try you. They're drawing people out. I, I, I hope that I'm not the only, well, I know I'm not the only one that can see this, but these guys who are being selected, all of them, something is happening to the populace as a result of them. Just what God said he would do. People are being drawn out left and right. They are. See, once a person finds a platform for whatever's in their heart, they're going to begin to 
spew out what's in their heart. If they have representation, which, because when Obama came, what did people say? Oh, he's the greatest. Wait a minute, follow me. I don't mean to offend everybody. I want you guys to see something. When Obama was placed in office, what did people do? They said, oh, he's going to solve everything now. They lifted him up, didn't they? And then the other side said, what, look at that. They're worshiping him like he's a messiah or something. That's what they said. Then they ended up saying, well, he's not going to leave office. He's, nobody's going to be able to remove Obama. In fact, listen to me, because it happened every single one. Every prophecy given to every president, as far as what they were going to do, failed. Every single one. From Obama to Trump, every single one failed. It did. It failed. It failed because God put them up there to do what? See, you guys are believers, and you belong to the living God. And these presidents exposed a weakness in us. See, if we have a weakness in us that can cause us to go against the word of the living God, how can we step foot to the kingdom of God? How can we do that? We still have vulnerabilities, don't we? If a person can make you go against Christ Jesus, there's no way in the world you're finished, and you got to go back into the oven. It happened with Obama. It happened with Trump. It's happening with Biden. It happened with just about every, and it's going to happen again in the very worst way with the next one. Listen, can I say this? This will not be in line with any order that America's ever had, and the people won't know what it represents. Mm -hmm. But for the Christians, thank God that he's doing what he's doing, because it has shaken people up, and they know they fell for it. They know. God gave his people the truth, didn't he? Nobody wanted to hear the truth. They wanted to hear the sensationalized stuff. They didn't want to hear the truth. They wanted the drama soup. They did. And they got carried away. So you can take a good person, a very good person, and every single human person out there is vulnerable to a runaway cycle that happens with humans and dogs and all animals. If, a, if, if a lot of people get together and they begin to think in a certain way, do you not know that it spreads out all throughout humanity? Do you not know that? It's called a mob mentality. You get two people excited, man, it's no big of a deal, right? 20, it starts changing. You get 100 people excited, people start joining in by leaps and bounds. Before you know it, nobody has control. It's a mob mentality. And the people on the outskirts have no idea what's happening on the inside. But they will join in by way of their emotional state because it will change. The same way that you feel somebody is looking at you because you're picking up on something. It's the same way the mob mentality works. You start picking up on the emotional state of those who are in concentration, probably near the front, and then you start doing the same things without really realizing what you're doing. And it's all by an emotional state of being. And when it's broken up, those on the outskirt, you know what they always say, they have always said this. Well, I wasn't clear what was actually happening. And they're not, they're not lying. They didn't know. They just joined in with the chaos. But it showed us. That can cause people to have a meltdown, Christians to have a meltdown. How can any human being upset us so much that we would deny what Jesus said and adopt what somebody else said? Is there anything that can cause us to fall like Satan fell? Because you're being tried. Do you think God would have another person in eternity or another being in eternity that would fall like Satan fell? Do you really believe that? You better believe you're undergoing a process, a thorough process. And have you noticed in the Word of God that the people who do make it are the ones who would never deny Christ? Do you know that? They did not deny Christ. Now, to deny Christ before men is to not act in holiness around people. How do we know this? By the example that was given to us in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Acts, and the book of Romans, and Titus, right? Hebrews also. We know this by those books. Because when we're around people, what we represent and what we do is our ministry to everybody. It is the world that will make you think it's what you're saying. Your father said how you live your life and what's in your heart for real. You can talk all day. But then when people go out there and they promote murder, something is wrong. What is hatred in God's eyes? Murder. Hatred. It's murder. How many people got amped up emotionally by what they were seeing enough that they joined in and said, yeah, go get him. See, I'm, I'm just telling you, you don't have to deny that. I already know the consequences of seeing something like that. You will be touched. You will be moved one way or the other. 
What we've got to do, though, is have enough Christ and belief and faith in us that if anything like that rises, we stand up as children of the living God, not heathens of any nation, but children of the living God with godly standards representing the kingdom of God as he would approve of it, right? Because if these men and women, I have to say that because everything is changing, but if these men and women of leadership in the USA can cause people to divide they have no chance against the Antichrist, do they? See, I, I think that people sometimes forget a powerful figure is coming, but only powerful to those who are still prone to the deeds of humanity. If a person can make you go against the principles of Christ, then how can they have a hope against the Antichrist? You see that? Why is it that we're... That's why I don't like people to come to me and say, Oh, Mike, you did, you know, the, 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 oh, don't thank me, thank the Lord. You know what? Because we have enough people worship in this world, don't we? We do. The entertainment industry is, is, is based on people worship. Movies, they're based on people worship. They are. In fact, what does America make, you guys? We make entertainment. Let's go ahead and face it. We make entertainment. We manage everybody else's assets, but we make entertainment. We intimidate and govern. God has given the U.S. an awesome position, and it's being usurped by greedy people. And the Christians, being complicit with it, are still looking for a representative among men to change the situation. It's not going to happen that way. It's going to get progressively worse. Case in point will be this time. You know how everybody said, well, this is going to be the last president. I, I can't even shake this. We're going to have a council. And this one will be like a roller coaster. You, you're not going to know what you have. It will unfold that way. And you're in the middle of a global staging event. It's just not going to be pretty. Because we keep sitting down, falling back into the same mindsets. I'll tell you all this. There's not a person on earth that will ever cause me to point at you. Do you know that? There's not an entity in existence that has the power to do that. I say that boldly because I've been fried in all aspects for that very thing. But can you say the same? It's no good if I can do it. If I can overcome it, fine. But it's no good if you cannot. If you're still vulnerable to this stuff in the world, then you're in danger. Do you hear me? You're in danger. Now what person knowing that someone they love is in danger is not going to say anything? You're in danger. Please don't blow it off. Nothing on this earth, no entity anywhere should have power to turn you against anybody. Don't allow anything to give you an excuse that you have the heart of Cain. Don't permit it. Purge it. Do what you have to do. All of you folks, you know, a lot of folks, they want to be, they say they, don't, they want to be pleasing to God, this and him. I know that many of you are sincere, but some, there are people out there, right, who want that same thing, but they're unwilling to give up anything for it. They're not willing to give up their own personal views that support this person or that person. Half the people are being blackmailed into believing the way they do. And what I mean by that, they know that if they do not conform to the public view, they're going to be chopped off. It's coming down to the wire. You know that, don't you? That this isn't for all of you, but it is for some of you. You're coming down to the wire. You're going to have to choose between your comfort and your salvation. Because you're compromising. And you're not willing to give up your comfort for anything, not even the Messiah. You're coming down to it. And it will not be some passive thing. But it will be what's necessary to secure people all the way. All the way. Not everybody is going to say no to it. Not everybody. But those who are meant have a strong trust. They'll do the right thing. But it's not going to be easy on them this time. Because the later it gets, the more the consequences amount up. We know that. But what heart is it that would keep comfort over salvation? And what is salvation, by the way? Salvation is when we desire not to sin. That's what salvation is. When we desire not to be who we have been. When we recognize there is good and evil in the world. When we start seeing the Messiah and the Father and Satan and Lucifer. And we start choosing the Messiah and the Father, when we do that, that's when we say no to sin. And when we truly say no to sin, that's when a powerful spirit is given to us to help us overcome all of our sins. All of them, not some of them. 
all of them. That's why you're so hungry and you'll never find what you're looking for by way of the world. What you're looking for is bound by the spirit in the realm of truth only. You cannot be an average person and find what you're looking for. That fulfillment you're longing for is found only within righteousness. And it requires that a person decide before they partake. The problem is with the people, not the leaders. The problem is not the leaders, it's the people. Because we're sitting back in recliners, not doing anything. Oh no, by the way, I, I can perceive this internally. There are some people, they would just like a clean... How many people want a clean slate? You ever want just a clean slate? Clean slate. You know, every time I talk about forgiveness, and there's a reason people don't like to talk about it, because in some cases people cannot forgive those, or they can't get the forgiveness of a person they wronged. Anybody like that? There's no way you can find them to get someone to forgive you, right? And sometimes that bothers people. I mean, yeah. Let me tell you something. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. You guys remember that thief on the cross? He didn't go back to tell anybody he was sorry. And Jesus looked at him and said, Today you're going to be with me in paradise. Ta-da! He didn't apologize to anybody. So what I'm telling you is this. Your acceptance of Christ is key. It's key. And when you accept Christ and realize the impossible things you've been forgiven of, right? You cannot help but to look at everybody else and cut them loose. When you really do receive Christ, you will hold no one hostage in your heart anymore. You won't. And the Lord sees your intent. He does. The thoughts and intent of your heart are quite visible to the Most High. He knows the truth of us. When he said, believe upon his name, and you're going to have salvation, you'll be saved, he meant it. But to believe upon his name is to not argue with the gospel. It is to receive the gospel. Receive the gospel. To believe upon his name is to believe what his name stood for. Is to believe what he did. Is to accept it. Is to live in it. So start living in it. Start walking by. Start realizing it. And don't let the devil lie to you. He's lying to most of you. He's lying to you. He's trying to murder some and he's lying to the rest. Don't accept his lies. Don't contemplate these words of condemnation. There's no more condemnation to them that believe, who walk not after the lusts of the flesh, but those who walk after the spirit. You want to be free. In your heart you want to be free. You are deemed the righteousness of Christ. We didn't earn that. That title was put on us through Christ because God refuses to lose you, that's why you believe. I'll say this boldly because I believe it. You will be delivered. When you truly believe in Christ, you will be delivered. That's why you're still here. It's not always a good thing to be in a rush to go to be in heaven because you're an undercooked turkey. And how many people would eat pink turkey? I'm not eating pink turkey with the vein in the back. I'm not doing that. No, no, no. It has to be properly prepared, right? Cooked. It has to be cooked. Because if it's not cooked, if it's not, it can poison everything it's added to. Your children are the king. You're going to be okay. Be sincere. And when you're sincere, that is key. All right? Let's continue. These people that say they're Jews and are not, listen to, how, listen to what the Lord said here. Behold, he says, I know you works. Behold, I set before thee an open door. No man can shut it. Thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come to worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Did you hear that? He's going to make them know that he loved you. So, in this context, what does that mean? Folks, you got to hear this. That means if you, if you in your life, because some people live just like this. They're around people who say they're believers, but they're full of hatred, full of animosity and jealousy and everything else, right? They always work up evil plans and you see it and it wears you out. And sometimes you feel stuck, useless, like you, you'll be of no effect to anybody. Here's what the Lord says. He, he says... He knows you have, you know, a little strength. You're not real strong. If you have little strength, you know what that means? That means you're not making it through everything in righteousness. Did you know that? That's what it means. I would consider myself a person of little strength. I think you guys have more. I do. It'll come out. Money's also saying this. You have little strength, but you've kept his word. 
but you have little strength. Now, in order for the Lord to say, you don't have that much strength, then that means he's observing you falling more than usual, correct? To say a person has just a little strength is to observe them fail. Do you hear me? So you would think the Lord would chastise. Well, get up and get stronger. No, that's not what he says. That's not what he's saying. See, that's hogwash too. A loving God would see a person trying, but then falling, but then getting up and trying. That's keeping his word, not denying his word. They've not denied his name. They have little strength. They've kept his word, but they have little strength. But they've not denied his name. See, some of you are like that too. You're not too different than that. You've not denied his name. But sometimes you fall into these traps. Let's call them traps. You get pressured into doing things or saying something you shouldn't. You get so weak sometimes. You're not really, you're not, you're not in full awareness of what the, what your immediate choices are going to bring. Then you find yourself in a mess. You think you've disappointed the Lord. You start going to him and praying because you're not denying his name. You're not going to pray to anybody you don't believe in. How about that? You're not going to cry out to anybody you don't believe in. Well, except you're a little kid and you cry out for Santa Claus or something, but that's not who you are. So you may fall from time to time. Not this per You're not going out to rob banks. That's not what I'm talking about. See, you get in a conversation and somebody really angers you in a conversation or hurts you in a conversation. And your reply is not exactly bound in righteousness. That means you don't have enough strength to overcome that situation. And so you fall prey to devices of the enemy. But you will not deny the name of Christ. And his name is promised to you because you're constantly talking to him, wanting him not to even see the iniquity of your life. You even feel a bit shameful from what you're doing. That means you have little strength, but you have not denied his name. You've not. What is he saying? You've not denied his name. He says, behold, I will make them that, that are of the synagogue of Satan, those people around you working evil. I'm going to make those people which say they are Jews and are not, which say they are believers and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Did you hear that? So instead of a chastisement, what do you receive? You receive a promise from the Most High, but he's going to show them, those people around you that said, you don't know enough, you're not smart enough, you can't work out things enough because you have little strength. Maybe you don't respond like everybody else. Maybe you're not quick like everybody else. Maybe you keep falling for the opi dope. Somebody's continuing to rob you. Maybe you keep falling for that. But the Lord is saying, I'm going to make those around you who are laughing at you, those who are pointing at you, those who constantly judge you, those people who say they're Christians but are not, but do lie. Those people that work iniquity around you, that talk too much, that gossip, that do everything they shouldn't do. I'm going to make them come and worship at your feet. So they will know that I have loved you. Isn't that awesome? So God's going to show them he loved you. God will show them he loved you. Which means if God is willing to do that for you because you have little strength, then they're also laughing, saying, well, maybe your life is like that because you sinned a great sin that you need to get right. Isn't that how they do? Huh? Isn't that how they do? Suppose a pastor gets sick. And some person who knows nothing about spiritual things says, well, maybe you're sick because, you know, you're just, you're wrong or some other foolish stuff that they say. And then what they say, and then what they say, not discerning, not understanding spiritual things, the Lord said, he's going to show them he loved you. That's wonderful. He didn't say you would be punished. He didn't say that. Why? Because what is God after? What perfection is God after? Can anybody tell me your truth? How many of you agree? with his gospel how many of you agree that everybody should be forgiven i mean every single how many of you agree that every single soul should have the ability to be forgiven how many believe that wholeheartedly how many believe that somebody says i'm confused about why i should not sue somebody who scammed me out of my retirement savings or if they scammed you out of your retirement period but if you have no retirement at all because of a disclosure you signed and then they turned it all around and come to find out you don't have retirement. You have zil zilcha. After all, you sewed into something and through a slick tongue, trying to work in slick ways. Now you have no retirement at all. What if somebody did that? Wouldn't you have all rights to sue them? In essence, they took future income that was owed to you and medical care owed to you and had you sign it all away. And then you find out you never had to sign all that away. Would you sue the individuals who defrauded you that way? 
Because here's the deal. You ready? Here's the deal. I'm not going to tell you what to do with your life. You're going to have to make that decision based upon the truth that's in you. But I've learned something in life. Number one, God can restore anything anybody ever took from you. That's number one. Number two, you can lose anything you ever had in multiple ways. That's what I learned. You can do everything right and lose everything you have. You can. You really can. You can do many things wrong and gain the whole world. You can. You really can because you're dealing with money. When you believe in Christ, believe in him all the way. Believe that he is your source and he is. Whenever you feel you have to sue somebody, you're also admitting that you, by yourselves, you have to get something because God will not supply it. Because if God said, hey, don't do that, I'll supply it, then of course none of us would sue, right? We wouldn't. To sue somebody is an avenue to seek revenge. To make someone pay you back. To make someone restore something. It's just an avenue. The Lord said, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Everything that we forgive, you think it's an accident? When trouble comes. And people are frightened to the point of having heart attacks. Because an enemy is in the land that's cruel and strong and numerous. And when nobody is protecting you, those who have sown mercy and forgiveness in this world, they will receive mercy and forgiveness in this world. So that when everybody else is paying and suffering and being thrown in trucks, they'll come to you and say, do not touch this one. They're not going to give you an explanation. All you may remember is this. Maybe I forgot giving someone down the road or something. Because when you sow mercy and grace, you will receive mercy and grace. You have a garden, all of you have a garden, and you will eat of that garden one way or the other before you depart this world. Whatsoever you have sown, you'll partake of, you'll eat. Hmm? Personally, I live my life in a specific way, and I won't sue a soul. God knows I've lost a lot, but I'm not suing. I am not doing that. But the Lord has his way about things. I had an opportunity to sue a company one time because of what they did. And a lawyer pressed me to sue them while you, you work because I got hurt. I did. I got hurt. They even checked with other entities and it was good to go. And I said no. And when I said no, right, something happened to me. And a week later, the Lord lifted both the condition and some other things all at one time. All of that would have been up in the millions. The Lord lifted that. The Lord does beautiful things. He will honor his word. His word will not return void. But we have to make that decision, right? Not like some corporate decision, no. We have to make a decision based on our faith. We have to follow him. So my advice to anybody out there, because each case is going to be different, seek the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your soul. Be obedient to the living God. Do that. You know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a, if, say, a person kept rebuilding their home, and every single year, some flood, some tornado, some something came through and took it. On the seventh year, three storms came in a row, and the guy was unable to rebuild his home because those three storms put the cost well beyond his ability to ever rebuild again, and insurance would not cover it all. So this guy would be so sad, disappointed. Two months pass, and he is homeless. Awful, isn't it? Isn't that awful? Two months pass, and he's homeless, and he's sitting down in the middle of the street, freezing in the middle of the night. All of a sudden, the ground starts shaking. And he kind of stands up and everybody else starts to feel the ground shaking. Nobody knows what it is. Then it shakes more violently. Nobody knows what it is. And then in the distance, he starts seeing flashes. Then on the left, flashes. Then on the right, flashes. Then this guy finds himself in the middle of a war he never thought was coming. Stuff is going off all over the place. Troops and everything start running. But see, this guy's not homeless in the town. His house got tore up in because he, he was forced. They didn't, they, they discouraged the homeless. So he ended up going two states over. Well, it just so happened his home area was ground zero for the war. And it was only four weeks since his house got torn down. But he lost all of his money, everything else. He thought life was over. He went homeless. But in truth, what God did was the first few storms, God gave a warning. The guy didn't listen. The last time, the Lord gave him three warnings in a row and took his ability to rebuild his home back away. And he still tried to hang around. And so he was homeless and he went totally broke. And it just so happened in that city, they would shuttle him over, two states over, to another community to house people who couldn't pay for anything. And that's where he went. And at that point, he thought he lost everything, but the Lord was trying to get him to move, but he would not do it on his own. The whole time, 
the Lord was speaking to him to move. And the whole time, the man would not listen so long as he had resources. To do what he wanted to do, he would not hear, nor would he respond to anything in the Holy Spirit. When the war came, the man stood up and he acknowledged. And it all came coming back and he knew at that point that the Lord did love him after all. See how easily we can misinterpret. We can misinterpret things around us all the time, but I, I assure you, if you believe in Christ, everything in your life is a communication. Everything is a communication in your life. Now it's up to us to hear or not. It's up to us. And see, sometimes we think when something happens, that's the way it's going to be permanently not knowing. If something happens, we'll say, well, it's going to be like this for the rest of my life. You, you, you may not know it, but the rest of your life could be two weeks. It could be three weeks. could be four weeks. But the rest of your life is not as long as you think it is. And rapid, unannounced changes. When they start taking effect, then and only then will you really know it. Until then, heed the word of the Lord. Follow his principles as best you can. Because he's speaking to you, all of you. Through everything that transpires in your life, he's speaking to you. So pay attention. Pay attention. Learn of him while you can. Do that and you'll find he's been watching out for you the whole time. What we call a benefit, what we call security, God just may call foolishness, or he may call it an obstacle. Either way, because you believe in him, he will never abandon you. Certainly in these times, pay close attention to everything in your life. One of my greatest concerns for everybody on earth, honestly, is being caught off guard. I cannot tell you how, but I saw a time that was out of season. It did not happen within season. It happened out of season. It happened too soon and too quickly. And the repercussions were too great. The change was too vast, too heavy. No one on earth was not frightened. Everyone had fear. No one knew it was coming. No one. And no one could have suspected it would have come that quickly. I can't give you any more on that except to say, I have a prayer. A prayer that I will, I've been reciting this, it, it's a set of words. You know what it is? It is, please, Lord, please do not let me get caught off guard. Please, help me to stay aware. That's what I say. Because somehow I saw the consequences of those who are going to be caught off guard. And I'll tell you something, that shouldn't happen to anybody. Because when it happens, the average person would have sorrow for the cruelest person on this earth. There's no way you would not weep for the cruelest person on this earth. Because those, that moment, the time that we live in right now, looks so similar. Same characters, which is supposed to be impossible, but the same characters are here now. So I have a very high confidence that something will take place too far out of season, too quickly, too vast. And many are going to be caught off guard. But I pray I will not be caught off guard. So every day to me, my mind is on the Messiah. That was my warning. Even the feelings won't lead me. They won't lead you. So we do live in very strange times. But the Lord is quite serious about his body. Listen, and he gave us instruction not to be interpreted by the mind, but by the spirit only. I pray people heed those instructions. Folks, what time what do we have here? Okay, wait a minute. I finish this up. The Lord says, But thou hast kept my word of patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, I know a lot of people want to be Philadelphia, right? They do. They do. They want to be Philadelphia. But every time trouble comes, people start running. I'm not talking about just the world, but I'm talking about the Christian. See, it's impossible that you have trouble that's not being overseen by the king. And a lot of you don't know that because you haven't read the scriptures yet pertaining to that. You cannot have a trouble that just is a trouble because you belong to Christ. That is very important. But if you choose Christ, continue to choose him every day of your life. If you do that, you'll never be caught off guard. If you do that, you'll be an asset to your families. You really will be. If you do that, your eyes will be opened 
to more than a few things.